Welcome to our review on magnets and magnetic fields. So the first thing we actually need to remember is something that you probably learned all the way back in key stage three or maybe even at primary school, which is that if we place two bar magnets together, then what we find is if we place their like poles, so a north and a north or a south and a south together, then they will repel and push away. But if we've placed opposite poles, so a north pole and a south pole together, then they will attract each other. So one thing you've probably seen at some point are these diagrams that show the magnetic fields around the bar magnet. Now, the lines that we've actually got on there represent magnetic flux. And the key thing that you can identify just by looking at that diagram is that the number of the field lines that we've got passing through a particular area is actually a relation to the actual strength of that magnetic field. And we refer to that as magnetic flux density or magnetic field strength. So what we can see in those two diagrams, on the left hand side, what we've got is the magnetic field lines that surround just a single bar magnet. So that's what you'd actually see if you placed the little plotting compasses and drew it, or if you scattered iron filings around a bar magnet, they'd line up in those particular orientations to show us the field lines. And on the right hand side, we've got two bar magnets that are attracting, so a north pole facing a south pole, to show what effect that has on those field lines. So what we actually find is that magnets will move in a direction that makes the field line shorter. So in our diagram on the left there, you can see we've got opposite poles facing each other, a north pole and a south pole. Now we know that those magnets will attract. And the reason for that is that if you look at the field lines between the north and the south pole, to make them shorter, they move closer together. So that's why they will attract. Whereas on the right hand side, if you look at the effect of having two like poles, so the two north poles facing each other, then the field lines are kind of being pushed kind of above and below as you look at the diagram. Now, in order to make those shorter, what we're going to have to do is the bar magnet is going to have to turn so that we actually have the opposite poles facing each other, as that's the way those field lines will become shorter. So what we actually find is that when we're talking about magnets, there are two different types that we need to be aware of. The first one, are the permanent magnets. So these are ones that are magnetic even when other magnets or current are being removed. So literally, the permanent magnet is one that just sitting on its own, that will still be magnetic. Whereas an induced magnet, this is one that's only produced when we've got a magnetic material placed in a magnetic field. And when we remove that magnetic field, it may or may not stay magnetic afterwards. So just make sure you remember the difference between the permanent magnet and the induced magnet. Now, one of the models to explain magnetism is what's called the domain model of magnetism. And what that actually does is it says that a permanent magnet is made up of many small magnetic regions, which they refer to as domains, that are all lined up. Now, what we find if we look at another material that is magnetic, something like iron or steel, for example, then they've got regions that are not lined up. But when we put them into a magnetic field, those regions will then line up, hence it becomes magnetic at that point. So that's pretty much what our domain model says, is that our permanent magnets, then all of those little domains are all lined up, whereas in our induced magnets, when they're not exposed to that magnetic field, those domains are not lined up, but when we do expose them to a magnetic field, it causes the domains to line up. Now, what we actually find is that once you remove that magnetic field, some of them will stay in their actual lined up version. Whereas others, once that magnetic field has been removed, they're going to return to their original direction. So one of the oldest uses that we as humans have got for magnetism is in good old compasses for navigation. So what we know is that if you've got a compass, then it's going to point towards the magnetic north pole. But one point that you need to remember is that the magnetic North Pole is not the same as the Earth's North Pole. And I've given you a little picture of the Earth there to show you the difference. So the North Pole itself of the Earth is at the very top there, which is basically that point at which the Earth is going to rotate around its axis. Whereas the magnetic North Pole is just off to the left of that in a slightly different location. So just remember, magnetic North Pole and the Earth's North Pole are actually different locations on our planet. 
if we consider what the Earth's magnetic field looks like, then what we find is that it's actually really similar to like a giant bar magnet. So what we actually refer to it as is like the Earth has got a large bar magnet at its centre, because the field lines that we generate from the Earth itself are just like the ones that you generate in the lab with the iron filings around a bar magnet. Now, what the scientists actually think the Earth's magnetic field is caused by is the convection currents within the molten iron core of the Earth. Now, that's still just a theory. We don't have the overwhelming proof yet, but it's the theory that we learn at the moment. And one other theory that's going around at the moment in science is that we're actually in a period where the Earth's magnetic field is in a reversal. So we know from the history of the Earth that it does have these regular reversals every several thousand years, for example. And what we actually find is that we've got this current period where there's some evidence that it might be in the process of reversing at this point in time. And so that's what the other two diagrams are representing at the bottom there. When we're thinking about the actual design of a compass, then we need to have them weighted because otherwise they don't lie horizontally. So we actually make them weighted as the needle so that they do lie horizontally within the actual device itself. Now, what we find is that we've got an angle between the field lines and a line horizontal to the Earth's surface, and that's known as the dip. So what we find is if we look at the actual degree value of that dip in different places, then when we're at the actual magnetic poles, then it's at 90 degrees. Whereas if we're at the magnetic equator of the Earth, then it's zero. But what that tells us is that if we didn't weight the compass itself, then it wouldn't lie flat and therefore it wouldn't work as the device which we all know and use.